Welcome to the worship of God with the church at Harpeth Heights. It's, it is our desire that you are gathered this morning expecting to be in God's presence. And, and while we are not quite able to be together in the same room, we, we are together this morning. We are we're called by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit to love and serve the Lord. Hear these words from Psalm 100 as we begin to worship. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. We do love to take the time each week to welcome you. I hope that we have many first time guests with us today and we invite you, if you are, or if you've only been with us a couple of times, to visit our website. You will find all that you need to know about our church and about how you can get in touch with us and get plugged in. It's also our custom to pass the peace to one another when we gather, and this is a challenge during this, this season of virtual worship, but uh, we still like to communicate through either text or through the chat feature right there on your on your screen uh, with one another. So take a moment and greet someone who you know is worshiping with you. Tell them you desire for the peace of Christ to be with them. Let's continue in worship. Good morning, church family. My name is Aksana. I'm Aaron. I'm Atticus. We have Miss Chris Farrell on the keyboard, and we are so grateful to worship together in our sanctuary, at our homes. And I wanted to encourage you with the word of the Lord as our call to worship in 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7. It says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, casting all your cares on him because he cares about you. And I don't know about you, but my heart has been heavy this week from all, from just grieving over our city, Nashville, and over all throughout our nation. And it's made me just cry out to the Lord and know that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are Christian spirit. So if you're there this morning, I pray that you cast all your burdens on him, that we can rest under his sovereign care and rule in our city, over our nation, and cry out for God to heal our land. So let us sing as creatures of our God and King and worship him in humbleness.
First John 3.18 says, Dear children, we must not just love with word or speech, but with truth and action. On May 29th, as part of our mobile food pantry, I was able to see our volunteers really putting their love to action and being able to share and speak truth with families. We had 302 people that we gave food to. It was a great morning of distributing food. And when it was all over, there was still food left over. And so we began the second part of food distribution. And that was to go to communities, to ministry partners all over our city and to give them some food to distribute as well. It was exciting to see as volunteers filled their cars and their trucks and went to places like the Rescue Mission, Project Connect, Grace Works, Front Porch Ministry. Over 10 ministry partners received food that they were able to distribute, including the Ark in Pigra. We were able to spread our love, his love, all over the city. So at the end of that event, the end of the day, we looked down and there are 40 bags of produce, grocery bags of produce. And we're trying to decide exactly where they need to go. And I asked my husband if he'd put them in our car. And he said, what are we gonna do with them? Right? And, and I said, well, I'm gonna take them to the community of trailers down the street. And he looked at me and he said, well, what's the plan? Are you, are you just gonna knock on doors and give out food? And I said, well, if that's what the Lord tells me to do, yes, but he hasn't told me that yet. He's just told me to go. So we arrive there and drive around and I, I'm looking, you know, saying, Lord, okay, where's the door? Where, where am I supposed to go? Um, what am I supposed to open here, Lord? What relationships are supposed to start? And I see a sign that says for information for the office to call this number. So we call the number and the office manager answers. And we say, you know, we have these, this produce that's left over from an event we did. We really want to give it to people that are in need. Do you have any people in your community that, that could use it? And she said, yes. When can you come? And we said, we'll be there in just a few minutes. And so we met her at the office space and unloaded the car and continuously she was thanking us and excited and telling us about the different families and how they could use it. We sorted through the food and set it up and she sent an, a text and called and people from the um, community began to come out and, and choose their food. And we had some conversations that were really great. And just hearing people's stories, hearing their struggles right now. Well, one lady in particular, I was really impressed with her presence and her peace and her constant and frequent reminder that she really liked tuna fish. After seeing the events on Saturday on the news and, and just really praying about what the Lord wanted me to do, he kept bringing tuna fish to my mind. And I don't like tuna fish. And so I knew that what he was telling me was that I had heard this woman, that I had seen her, and that I needed to go and show her truth in action. So with my bag of tuna fish, I went back to see her. It led to an hour of a gospel conversation where I was very blessed to learn that she had, she really had accepted Jesus into her heart, um, was living a life of following him, and that she was ministering to others around her. She and I have become quick friends. What I learned from that, though, is how important it is, especially during these times, for us to continue to walk in love, to hear and to listen. We are not to just speak, but to act. 
to affirm and to protect, to let others know that they have worth and value. So who is it this week that God wants you to listen to and that he wants for you to let them know that he values them? By your actions, you can speak that. Would you pray with me, please? Father, I just thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ all over the world, Lord. You have created us and made us for purpose. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see your plans and that you would help us to be people who not only speak love, but who show it in our actions and our truth. Lord, I pray that you would shape us that you would be in control and, and of every action that we take. May we decrease, Lord, and you increase. May you give us opportunities to speak and to act where we can show others that we see them, that we value them, because we know that they are your creation. Father, I pray that all that we give of our time, of our resources, of our talents, Lord, that it would bring honor to you and that it would speak and share and spread the gospel. I ask this in your name. Amen. I'm reminded that God blesses us to bless others. And that is not out of our own good deeds but it's Christ working through us. And this next song we're gonna sing is, Yet Not I, But Through Christ in Me. And that is our hope. Our hope is only Jesus. And so we sing this today, this morning.
Good morning, we're the McCoy family. I'm Jake. And Allison. Elizabeth and Charlie. And this morning we'll be reading from Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 14. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks the door will be opened. Who among you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you want others to do for you, do also the same for them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate who is right in the road broad that leads to destruction. And there are many, many who go through it. How narrow the gate and difficult the road leads to life, and few find it. It's good to be with you again, church family. It was also good to be with the North Region Pastors last week as we went through, began in Matthew chapter 7, and we're back at it this morning. So if you have your Bibles, you just heard the passage beginning in verse 7, go ahead and and turn to it. You know, I've been a part of a few uh, intentional small groups um, in the past, men's groups, where in the outset of our time together, we all take turns and we we share our stories with one another. It's always been, been powerful to participate in this, to to hear how fellow disciples, how they make sense of their own journeys. And in order to be in relationship with one another, we, we, we have to be able to, to tell pieces of our story. 
It's how we interact with one another. A life story does not just communicate events. It also says why events along the way were important. What they mean for who the person is and who the person will become. What has happened in life and, and how we make sense of it goes a long way in informing what will happen later in our lives. The question that I'm pondering this morning is what it is exactly that, that tells us who we are as people. And we can gain insight into this question, I believe, if we look at, at how we construct and tell our own life story. And I'm thinking about this because in this great Sermon on the Mount, which is in no way ordinary, I believe this is what Jesus is, is trying to help us understand, that precisely what it is that tells us who we are as people. Let's look at what Jesus has taught us thus far. Does our story include a lot of attempts at accumulating things? In other words, are we storing up treasures on earth where, where moth and rust, where moths and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal? And if so, it's likely that our stuff says a lot about who we are as people. Or does anxiety abound in our lives? Are we, are we wound up a lot of the time in, in fear over, over what may happen to us or, or those that we love? And if we are, now remember, we are likely spending most of our time thinking of ourselves and, and thinking of our own circumstances and dealings, leaving very little time to be thinking of the other person. Or are we spending a great deal of time judging and, and condemning one another. One thing I've learned about the need I feel to judge and condemn is that it has a lot to do with, with my need to, to control another person, to, to get them to be the kind of person I think they need to be. In, in other words, I'm attempting to help control and define who they are as people. Now to let God be the judge is to relinquish from my life my need to control another person in this way. Instead, we are to let go and entrust them and in turn ourselves into God's care. So we come to today's passage. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and, and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks find, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So if I'm not wound up in anxiety or, or spending all of my time storing up earthly treasure, if I'm not constantly evaluating and correcting your behavior, your life story, if I'm not doing those things, then... And only then am I freed up to entrust my life and everything about it to God. And perhaps then it can be that God tells me who I am as a person. Jesus' teachings in this great sermon, they really can take root and help define our lives. Dallas Willard said that in this sermon, Jesus is defining for us what it is, the good life, looks like. So as we, as we each process and, and tell our own life stories, inevitably, we, you know, we encounter conflict and we must process it and tell of it. Every story has conflict or, or it's a boring story. God's answer to that conflict is the story that belongs to so many of us gathered here around our devices. We were introduced to Jesus somewhere along the way. We were, we were told that he is the good shepherd, that 
that he loves us and, and will never leave us, that, that he will not hold against us our sin, that, that he'll forgive us and make us whole, make us new. And the church, at its best, teaches us that this is who we are, that you're a person whom, whom God loves, that you cannot do anything to make God love you less. Or more. God's love for us defines us. God's love tells us who and whose we are. We who are evil know to give our own children good things. How much more will God give us good things whom he loves? But for a moment, put yourself in the sandals of the average hearer of the Sermon on the Mount. It, it would have been hard to hear Jesus say that God will give good things to God's children. Remember, their reality was that they were totally beholden to Roman authority, that this Roman authority that exercised dominance over them daily, Roman authority that could kill them lawfully at any moment. I cannot relate to that. I have never feared for my life, not really. I've never been threatened with poverty. I have never known physical hunger. I have never lived in perpetual fear of annihilation by armed soldiers. But for Jesus to claim that God hears us and gives good things, well, to believe that required a ton of faith for Jesus' audience. I've been reminded in the past couple of weeks that that there are people who live with and among us who also find it hard to believe based on their experience in the world that God gives good things to God's children. Now, I don't ever want my words to bring up or to cause division. The gospel of Jesus Christ brings people together. But sometimes healing requires discomfort. And we have some work to do. My white brothers and sisters, we have work to do. In verse 12, Jesus says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. What tells us who we are as people? Well. How we treat one another says an awful lot about it. And if I'm listening closely, I will hear that there are those among me today, that there are those around us today who are hurting. Jesus often told stories about hurt, about danger. A shepherd had a hundred sheep. One got away. One was lost and lost and in grave danger without the protection of the flock, without the protection of the shepherd. So the shepherd leaves the flock and retrieves the one sheep. The, the shepherd, in doing so, did not declare the 99 unimportant or expendable. The 99 were not in danger, but the one was. And the one was worthy of being retrieved. Another time, Jesus told of a man left on the side of the road. He was beaten and left for dead. Two religious leaders passed and and did not tend to him in his time of need. His supposed enemy, a Samaritan, came by and did not notice him. And he stopped to care for him. He went to great lengths to care for him in his time of need. If we know that Jesus has truly come into our lives and made us new, and if we entrust everything into God's care, then we are freed up to believe that God will give good things, that God will give the best things, that God will take such good care of us because, because God is with us and God is for us and God is unto us. If, if this truth is what defines who we are, then now, now hear me, we are free to hear the people in our lives who are hurting, who are truly in need. We are free to actually hear our black 
brothers and sisters, to really hear them and, and to try to respond to them. Now, now, maybe you're tuning me out when I specify our black sisters and brothers. I, I hope not. I, I can't control that. But as I have been cared for in my life, I am called to the hurt that I see in front of me, and I'm calling us all to it as well. I was pulled over on the interstate uh, in Alabama recently, last week. I, I was going too fast, which I try very hard not to do, but I did, and I got caught. And as I sat on the side of the interstate and, and waited for the officer to, to come to my window, I, I reflected for a moment, in that moment, on George Floyd's death. Now, I believe that the majority of police officers are intent upon protecting and serving in an appropriate manner. And of course, all lives matter. The kingdom is available for anybody. It's available for everybody. And yes, people kill people every day. Our world is so broken. George Floyd's murder is on video and he was killed by a person with a badge, an authority figure. And that renders a different kind of fear. A fear that Jesus' audience would have understood. Jesus understood this about his audience. And what his audience feared ultimately killed Jesus. And his life testified to helping these marginalized folks to understand that God was with them, for them, and unto them. That's what Jesus did. The officer that pulled me over was a, was a black man. And still, my conditioning, my life experiences, it led me to only, and I mean this, only be concerned in that moment about whether or not I would be on the hook to pay a speeding ticket, which I absolutely deserved. And as I drove away, and I did indeed get a citation, I imagined what it would be like for that citation to have been among the least of my concerns. I want to understand better what that would be like. I, I want to continue to educate myself about, about what it is like to be marginalized in our world today. As I think about my life and, and the story that I'm telling about my life there, there are so many examples of times that, that I've gotten off track, that I've lost my way. And I've always had people to, to help guide me back. Always. I have you for that, church. And I need you. We need each other. But the kingdom is for everybody. We all need people who will fight for us. People who will see us. Who will who will come and find us, who will help nurse us back to health. Jesus said, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Pastor and professor, the late Fred Craddock wrote, when I was in my late teens, I wanted to be a preacher. When I was in my late 20s, I wanted to be a good preacher. And now that I'm older, I want more than anything else to be a Christian, to live simply, to love generously, to speak truthfully, to serve faithfully, and to leave everything else to God. I resonate with Dr. Craddock. I, I want to be a Christian, and that is my story. And I'm sticking to it. Now, go tell your story. How we live is how we tell our story. In our response time, we're going to take a few moments to, to pray together. There, there's no recipe for this. You don't even have to feel like you are good at praying necessarily. We are encouraging one another to come before the Lord, to listen for our Father's voice, our Father who is in heaven, who has sent His Son to earth 
and left his Holy Spirit to dwell in us and to help make this world more like things are in heaven. Would you please join me in praying?
Hey, Howell. Hey. <laughs> so we are, this is like 11 weeks in, and when I, you know, Leslie and I are both working, and so a lot of these work days are at home and have been, even though our offices are back open now, which is really cool. But mm -hmm. when I'm recording at home, Howell, it's, it's pretty adventurous, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Sometimes there are some interruptions. Uh, <laughs> But we get it done every week, and it works out, doesn't it? Yep. And I love having Howell join me for the benediction, and it, it's been such, it's been so good to be with you in worship today. And I pray that you are encouraged and challenged, and I pray that you know that you are a person in whom Christ, um, <laughs> no, you are a person who is loved and who is sent and who is never alone because you are a person in whom Christ dwells. <laughs> and you're a person in whom Christ delights. And we are living in the unshakable kingdom of God. Yes, we are. And that kingdom is not in trouble. So neither are you. Praise, Praise God, God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.